Welcome to The Positioning Show, where we discuss topics related to the practical application of positioning for marketing, sales, and product teams. I'm April Dunford, a consultant, author, and the world's leading expert on positioning for B2B technology companies. Hey, welcome to another edition of The Positioning Show with me, April Dunford. Hey, you know what? This isn't just any other edition of The Positioning Show. It's the last one for season one. I know. Can you believe it? It's happened so quickly. This podcast has been going for six months, which is a long time. So I'm going to be taking a little break, taking a break between now and probably the beginning of next year, 2024. So yeah, I hope you enjoy the last episode. I really appreciate you all joining me for this little podcast experiment. It's been really fun. I've had the chance to cover a lot of topics in a lot of depth and from the feedback and the reviews, I think people have enjoyed it for the most part. So I hope to see you again soon and let's carry on with the episode. Hey, last week, somebody left a comment on this podcast and they said, can people work with you? And the answer is, of course you can. In fact, my main job is consulting. You might be surprised to learn. Actually, I work mainly one-on-one with tech companies. I only do B2B companies. And generally, I only work with companies that have a sales team. The main thing I do is a workshop. In that workshop, we work through the component pieces of positioning and then translate that positioning to a sales pitch. We do that as a facilitated exercise with a cross-functional team that usually includes the whole executive team. I do lots of these across the span of a year. I'm usually booking two, three months in advance. If you want to learn more about that, aprildunford.com, click on the button that says consulting and you can figure out how to work with me. Let's get to today's episode. So today I want to talk about how marketers can use a sales narrative. Part of the reason I'm thinking about this is that I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and I had a conversation with a senior marketing executive and he had just moved from a company that did a very low price point product that was sold zero touch with no sales team, sort of low price point, high volume kind of a thing. And he had recently in the last few months switch to a company that was much more of an enterprise product. So much higher price point, much lower volumes of deals, very much sales involved in every single deal. And so he told me that one of the big things that he had learned there is the difference in the way he had to think about storytelling. So in his previous job, marketing had full control over storytelling. So they could do a lot of creative things with storytelling. They did a lot of experimentation with storytelling. They didn't have to worry about how that story translated over to the sales side of the house. When he joined the new company, he found that he was doing storytelling stuff and creating things, throwing it over to the sales side of the house and sales just simply rejected it. <laughs> and at the beginning he thought, well, what's wrong with those jerks? Why aren't they not listening to anything I have to say? But then later what he realized is that he lacked an understanding of a lot of the things that the sales team needed to accomplish within the storytelling structure. So for example, he really didn't understand the way that qualification and discovery worked inside a typical sales pitch. He needed to give the sales team a way to talk about the company's point of view on a market and kind of position the product within the market versus other things that companies might use to accomplish the same job. He also needed to give the sales team a good spot in the narrative to do things like handle objections and talk about things like pricing and deployment and change management. And so his conclusion to all of that is that rather than having marketing start with storytelling and then create stories and then kind of throw it over to sales and hope that sales is able to adapt that story, he took a completely different approach where he was starting with a sales pitch or a sales narrative and then taking that sales narrative and using it to adapt to all kinds of things he was doing on the marketing side. Personally, I think this is a much better approach if you happen to be in a B2B company that has a sales motion that involves salespeople. I think it's much easier to start with something that works really well for the sales team. And when I say works really well, it, it allows us to communicate our point of view on the market. It allows us to talk about alternative solutions and the pros and cons of that. It allows us to really, really hone in on our differentiated value. It gives us a place to handle objections. It gives us a place to talk about change management and what happens next. So it's a lot easier for us 
to build a sales pitch that accomplishes that stuff and then ensure that that works for the sales team and then take the component pieces of that sales pitch and then go back over to marketing and then use that as the starting point for a lot of the storytelling we're doing over in marketing. If we don't do it that way, what we end up with is marketing's telling one set of stories over here, sales gets on the receiving end of these marketing stories, can't use them for their purposes, and then they start messing around with them. And so the next thing you end up with is two completely different stories and customers getting really, really confused because they're hearing one thing on the marketing side and another thing on the sales side. So if what we really want is consistent positioning and consistent messaging across the entire customer journey, then we'd be better to start with the sales side, back that into what we want to do in marketing rather than the other way around. So in my new book, Sales Pitch, there's a section right at the end that talks about how can we actually use the sales pitch in different things that we're doing in marketing. So I thought that would make a good episode and that would be a good topic for us to talk about today. I'd like to give you a set of examples. So first of all, when we think about the homepage and what we're doing on the homepage, Typically, the homepage is oriented around communicating our differentiated value and making it clear uh, who we're for and why those types of customers should choose us over the alternatives. We don't necessarily use a storytelling structure to do that on the homepage, but that doesn't mean that we can't use a sales narrative structure in other places where we do marketing. So let me give you the first example of this. So my Probably my favorite example is the buyer's guide. In my career, probably every company I ever worked at, at some point we built a buyer's guide. If you've read my book or have read anything I've written on my newsletter or anything else, you'll know that one of the key things that we have to worry about in B2B is how difficult it is for buyers to make a purchase decision. So buyers are absolutely overwhelmed with information and yet at the same time kind of starved for insight or ways to make sense of that information. At the same time, customers are very, very worried about making poor decisions or more importantly, the consequences of making a poor decision. They're worried they're gonna mess up and that's gonna result in bad things happening. Like maybe they get passed up for a promotion or they look bad in front of their boss or their teammates hate them or something like that. So we as vendors need to take the posture of a coach, specifically a buying coach or a buying guide. So why wouldn't we build a buyer's guide? A buyer's guide is basically marketing material that serves specifically that purpose. The purpose of a buyer's guide is to help a customer make a better informed decision. A great buyer's guide essentially follows the same structure as the setup phase in my sales pitch structure that I talk about in my book. To review, the setup phase has three pieces. It's the insight, your unique insight into the market, or the thing that you know about the job or the problem that no one else knows. The second step to that is, here are all the different alternative ways you could go about accomplishing the job and the pluses and minuses of that. And the last is, you know, our definition of the perfect world or what we think a perfect solution for a certain type of buyer is. A good buyer's guide accomplishes exactly that. So we could use that same structure to help companies understand what they need to think about when they're actually in a purchase process. So a buyer's guide could start with our insight how do we look at the market? What do we know about the market? We could be teaching customers what we believe they need to know to really understand how to make a good purchase decision. Then we can have a section of the buyer's guide where we're comparing different approaches to the problem. We're showing the pros and cons to each approach to the problem. Now the key here in a really good buyer's guide is we have to be absolutely truthful here. We can never be seen as bashing the competition. Like we actually have to give our competitors credit where they are strong, but at the same time, we shouldn't be shy about calling out where they're weak. That's the whole point of the buyer's guide if we're creating one. So we need to be truthful in this alternative step if we're communicating that in the buyer's guide. And then a good buyer's guide should give our recommendation or it should at least point customers to what we believe is really important when they're in a purchase process. 
A second thing we might want to do with a sales narrative is an explainer video. Now, these kind of go in and out of fashion. Marketers tend to love them or they hate them or they love them for a year and then they get rid of it and they hate it for a year. Most of the companies I know have some kind of a video asset that attempts to explain, you know, here's what our offering is, here's what it does, here's the value that it can deliver, here's who it's for. My sales pitch structure is actually a really, really good structure for an explainer video because it does exactly that job. So it starts with the insight. Here's what we think is really important. Here are the pros and cons of alternative approaches to the problem. Here's what we would recommend customers like you pay attention to. And here's how we define good purchase criteria for a purchase. And then we would switch gears and talk about our differentiated value and the features that we have that support that differentiated value. It sounds like a lot to cover in a minute or two minutes or however long you want to make your explainer video, but I've seen lots of companies use exactly this structure and it works out pretty well. Another way we can use the sales narrative is when we're thinking about tutorials, help guides, onboarding, things that are kind of associated with the product itself. So obviously we're not going to use the full sales narrative in that stuff, but there are places in all of this material where we could use pieces of the sales narrative. Particularly, we need to be very concerned about our differentiated value, how that gets communicated, what we need to teach people in all of our materials related to the product, about why that differentiated value is important. So I think thinking about that and understanding the sales narrative is actually a really good place to start when we're thinking about some of these things like help guides, onboarding, tutorials, that kind of thing. Now, one thing you have to be really careful about this, if you're thinking about using the sales narrative in product related things or onboarding or tutorials, often it's the case that your buyers are actually a really different persona than your end users. So if that's the case, you need to be really careful. If you've got a sales pitch that is really oriented towards this buyer persona, then that's not necessarily the narrative you want to be giving to end users. In that case, you've likely got different positioning, different differentiated value, maybe even a different point of view on the world that you're communicating to end users versus what you're trying to communicate to a management level buyer or some other level of buyer that is actually the persona that you know, would go through the sales process and actually does the deal. So just be careful with that stuff. If you're trying to use sales narrative stuff and things for end users, you need to be really clear on who's the buyer persona here versus who's the user persona. Sometimes they're the same, often they're not. Next is the conference talk. Now, listen, you never want to be selling from the stage on a conference talk. That's a great big no-no. That's a good way to never get asked back to do a conference talk again, frankly. But the setup phase for a sales narrative often is a really good structure for a conference talk. So if we think about it, the setup phase is our unique insight into the market, a discussion about pros and cons of the current way of doing things or the traditional way of doing things and kind of communicating our point of view on this is what we think a really good solution in the market should be like. So that's actually a really good structure for a conference talk. And so I've seen founders in companies where we've worked on the sales narrative, peel out the setup part of the sales narrative and use that as a structure for a really good talk for a conference or an online event or some other kind of event where they're talking about things, but it's not appropriate to actually be selling. If you think about it, the audiences at these things come to learn new perspectives on the job it is that they're trying to accomplish or the problems that they have. So this kind of a talk is actually really appropriate. Not only that, it's actually super interesting for customers sitting in the audience. The next one I like to think about is graphical elements. In my opinion, companies really ignore this one and it's kind of an underused, cool thing we can work into our positioning. And what I mean by that is a graphic that kind of explains where we fit versus everything else that the customer already has in their tech stack that may touch on this. So sometimes the graphic can do a really good job of making it really clear what do we interface with in your current tech stack versus what are we actually planning on replacing in your current tech stack? 
So I've seen this done in lots of different ways. So I'd like to give you a handful of examples. One example is postmen. So prospects for postmen often come in and before they had these graphics, the prospects were really confused about, you know, what exactly is postman replacing versus what is postman going to interface with? So people would say, well, wait a second, like is postman is this platform for APIs. Does that mean it's going to replace my API gateway? Or does that mean it replaces my CI CD tools or other things around? And so Postman created a couple of different graphics to help make this really, really clear how this works. So they have one graphic that you'll see if you, if you click on platform that shows exactly what's included in the Postman platform and exactly what they interface with. They created a second graphic that I really like a lot called the API platform landscape. You can just Google that API platform landscape postman and you'll see this graphic. Um, the graphic is a bit of an eye test. There's like a thousand different logos on there. And what it shows is a big box in the middle and then a bunch of boxes around the outside. In the middle, it's got a whole bunch of different categories of things that you might do with APIs. So API testing, API documentation, lots and lots of things. There's all kinds of stuff. And under each of those categories, it lists a set of vendors and it shows a set of icons for things that you might have in your portfolio right now that essentially Postman can replace. So if you're a designer, you're going to look at this graphic and you're going to say, oh my gosh, that thing's an eye test. It's terrible. There's too much stuff on there. But that's actually kind of the point. The point is everything in that middle box can be replaced by Postman. So like, Imagine the reduction in complexity that instead of using 59 different tools to do all this different stuff, you could accomplish it all in one API platform that could manage the entire API lifecycle for you. It also makes it clear what Postman doesn't do, which is all the stuff that's outside of that box. So for that reason, I really like that graphic. Another example is GitLab. GitLab has a really broad set of functionality that they've broken down into a handful of categories and mapped those categories onto this infinity graphic. The neat thing about it is it shows that the software development is actually a life cycle thing. It's continuous. There is no beginning and no end. And hence there's this infinity thing. It communicates a lot of information with one very simple graphic. It also does a great job of, again, communicating their differentiated value. Their differentiated value is they're the world's most complete platform. So the point is, look at all this stuff. We can do the whole thing from the beginning to the end. You can also see where they've added security and governance as an overlay on that, which I think is kind of a nice way to use that graphic as well. So here we have the entire life cycle, and then we have security and governance, which is happening all across the life cycle. It's a nice, easy graphic that communicates a lot of information. If you think this is easy, this is actually really hard to build a graphic that does this really well. And I know it's hard because I've seen some examples from companies that I think do great marketing actually do kind of a bad job of this specific thing. I hate to pick on them, but I'm going to, I'm going to pick on Salesforce. I think it's really difficult when you're a larger company and you've done a lot of acquisitions to kind of make this good graphic that helps people understand how all the products in the portfolio actually fit together. If you look at the Salesforce customer 360 graphic, that thing is basically a circle and the circle includes a whole bunch of things. So it's got the three big pillars of Salesforce's platform, which is sales cloud, marketing cloud, service cloud. But then it also includes brand names for things they've acquired. So Tableau, MuleSoft, Slack, and then there's other things on there that aren't actually products. They're different things. Like there's net zero is sitting there as one of the things. And then one of the things is industries. So it's actually quite confusing because what we have is actually a circle. And it leads you to believe that each of these things are actually equivalent when in fact they're not equivalent. Like some of those things are an overlay on other things. And some of those things are not. So for example, Tableau is something that you could use with sales cloud or service cloud or marketing cloud. And so it's sitting there all on its own. It's a little confusing. We have Einstein sitting in the middle, but it isn't exactly clear. Like is Einstein an underlying technology or is it something that sits over top? 
And then there's other things that are kind of confusing to me in particular, like where's data cloud in there? I kind of would think of data cloud as being an underlying thing that crosses everything, especially when we're thinking about AI. In short, that graphic is a hot mess. <laughs> and so what I think it actually is, is it's a list of things that are in Salesforce, but the actual graphic itself doesn't actually add anything to the discussion. You could accomplish the same thing with just kind of a list of things. Next, uh, research, white papers, other long form content. Again, these are places where I think our sales narrative can inform this stuff. So for example, a lot of the companies that I've worked with in this insight piece, they're specific point of view on the market, they're actually conducting research around that. And so the research kind of helps them explore and validate that their point of view on the market is actually correct. And this is something that's happening. And this is something that's provable with numbers and data. So the great thing about doing this research is it's actually this nice virtuous circle. Our insight informs what we want to do research on. Once we've done that research, those numbers and the results of the research can feed back into the sales pitch, which actually makes the whole thing better. So I think really understanding what your insight is first, and then using some of that to dictate some of this longer form content to try to help bolster that insight, and then also use it in your marketing materials so that you're educating prospects before they get to the sales pitch on your point of view of the market or your insight into the particular job that you guys do. The last piece of marketing content that you might explore producing is a book. And I think that my sales pitch structure works very well as a structure for a book. In fact, I think it works so well that I actually used it as the structure for both my books. So if you read Obviously Awesome or Sales Pitch, particularly Sales Pitch, if you read that book, it's kind of interesting. That book actually follows the exact structure that I'm teaching you in the book. It's so meta. <laughs> So that's it for this week. One thing I wanted to leave you with is I've launched a newsletter fairly recently. And last week I did a really deep dive guide on how to do positioning across multiple products, multiple market segments, and multiple personas. I touched on this in an earlier version of the podcast, but I thought maybe it deserved the deep dive treatment. And so if that's interesting to you, you can go to aprildunford.com slash books. You can sign up for the newsletter and you'll see that newsletter there. That's it. I hope you have a great week. 